Hi everybody. Today I have the honor to meet one of my heroes, one of the people that has inspired me to not only make music but to buy a shitload of gear. <laughs> Thanks to this man, uh, I bought the original MPC, I bought the Machina MK3, the SP404. I am so happy to meet you. I'm so happy that you agreed to be here. Big welcome to Mr. Accurate Beats. Welcome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Being invited to things like this is always it's always nice and fun and cool. First thing I'd really love to talk to you about is that you've done something lately that has been the dream of probably anyone who has started making music. And that is making your own individual studio outside of the house. Because most of us either have like a corner in the living room or if we're lucky enough, we get a whole room for ourselves. But the big dream, you know, that, that space outside of your home where, you know, your sacred spot. How's that? expectation versus reality going up to now? Well, it's it's kind of complicated actually, but I'm really happy. I'm in that studio right now, the separate studio space. That's the one I'm in right now. And I'm really happy about the studio and I'm excited about having it. But it kind of hit me that to have a studio like this, it would make sense if I made like music and videos and stuff full time. But I'm also a dad and I have social life and I have a day job that I work three three days a week at my day job so I just find myself not being able to go here as much as I kind of wanted to or as I thought I would which kind of leads me into ending this contract and moving to a new house and setting up a studio space in the basement in my new house instead yeah do you find it like it gets in the way of your creativity because like I've, I've often thought about, you know, going out and, you know, doing a, a separate studio, but I found that like most of the time, and especially being a dad, the times where you can actually sit down and make music is like way in the night when all the kids are sleeping and, you know, everybody just stops. So like having to go to a separate place, I think would kind of get in the way of all that maybe. Yeah. And I kind of had my, my doubts about this entire thing before I got it thinking just like that that it's it's not going to be possible to go here and i mean the studio space is about five minutes from my home so it's nothing to like to talk about i can walk here for in seven minutes or something but the thing that matters to me and my creative output both in terms of videos but mostly for for beat making and, and creating music is that i need to be able to do it whenever inspiration hits you know and that's just not possible, even though it's just five minutes away somehow. That's, <laughs> uh, it's been a little bit disappointing, to be honest. But, you know, uh, th that's just life, I guess. But the thing is, if I'm working on a specific project, like a video review or something like that, it makes total sense to go here and dedicate time to work on it. But that whole thing about like learning a new piece of gear or exploring music, I need to do that. As you said, at, at night or in the weekends and in the, in the middle of the night and just be creative like that. So going here, yeah, it's awesome whenever I get to be here, but it's just not as often as I hoped, you know? You know, I totally relate to what you're saying because like most of the music that I make, I'd say like the good songs that, that I've made or the music that I'm proud of mm -hmm. is usually stuff that comes along like I stumble upon it when maybe I'm just doodling around, you know, I have like five minutes before I go to work and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll set up a synth yeah. and oh man, this sounds great. But whenever I sit down purposefully, it's just like, okay, I'm going to write my song. It, it's just so much harder. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as fluid. Exactly. And like my specific way of making music has so much to do with exploring samples and sounds and you know, spending a lot of time editing. That only comes whenever I want to do it. That has to come from the heart. That has to come from the creative, like, endeavor that I'm in. So, like, going to the studio, setting my mind to, yeah, I'm gonna be creative now, that just hasn't worked out because that's not a part of my creative output somehow. You always learn from things. So, even though this was, again, kind of a disappointment, yeah, I've actually really learned something about it. And you work from home in your studio, that's at your house, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's the thing, like, I, I've often thought about it, and beyond the, the obvious problem about, you know, the cost of having a separate space, 
what happens when I want to be creative right now when I have an idea, like, for example, yeah. something like the Octatrack that, that takes mm. some time to set up and everything. And it's way over there in an office where I can't reach it right now. And by the time that I get to it, I'll probably have forgotten what I want to do with it in the first place. So yeah. kind of like the missed opportunity of having your, your instrument somewhere else. Yeah. And, and to me, everything comes like as one big package somehow. Sure, I can make beats on just an NPC and nothing else, but the whole thing about having gear and like, you know, having access to instruments is to have access to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even if I bring the NPC at home, then of course I'm gonna like be stuck in this mindset of wanting to sample something from the from the Jupiter or whatever. And then I can't do that and then it becomes like this thing and I just focus on the wrong thing, you know? Has the pressure contributed to like blocking your creativity? For me, I took the first semester of this year. I tried to go like, not, not full YouTube, but I, I quit half of my day job. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do half YouTube mm -hmm. and half uh, my day job. Oh, really? Yeah, but I think I jumped the gun a bit. <laughs> I was a bit um, too optimistic. And the thing is, I pressured myself way too much. And I found that I was having a hard time coming up with videos or music or whatever, because I was so worried that now I had this this economic responsibility now. I got inside my own head and I had to like uh, turn back a bit. So not now like 80, 20. But like, how about you? Like the, having a different studio, having to pay for a different space, did that contribute or was that like a negative in terms of creativity? No, 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 no. Uh, having the space itself, uh, it's super affordable actually to have this space. And it's not like that brings a lot of like anxiety to stuff in terms of finances. Not at all. But I've done kind of the same thing as as it sounds like you did. Uh, now I work 60-40. So 60 on my day job, 40 here, I guess. Uh, but I'm also trying really hard not to think about myself as a 40% YouTuber. Because YouTube isn't, all, isn't everything I do in here. I'm making music. I'm releasing, sure, everything on YouTube. But I'm also trying to... In 2023, I'm going to start like putting more time into my Patreon and I'm going to try to book myself for like doing live in real life workshops with people at like places that do that kind of stuff, like culture that's houses awesome. and stuff that we have in Sweden. So that's going to be a part of the income too. Yeah. So, so everything like combines into me being some type of freelancer in the media music space it's not all youtube because if i think about myself like a youtuber then i get anxious about it <laughs> and then it becomes problematic since we're moving to a new house it's going to be cheaper to live there basically so i could afford to live like the poor life of a of an artist a few years and just give this give this thing a try yeah yeah i mean like it's it's now or never man that, that that's how i think yeah of it. i think we're the same age you and i and having like kids and family and stuff and all the stuff i've been through it feels like i kind of need to focus on the stuff that makes me happy and the things that i think i could make a living out of so i think it makes sense for me i i remember hearing something like on a podcast about you know uh, financial independence and everything and the guy was like what do you think is more risky you know taking this chance that might not work but you can always end up where you were before you can always go back to your day job or is it riskier to like not take the chance and spend your whole life wondering man what would have happened if i would have just you know taken my shot you fall down sometimes and sometimes it gets rough and sometimes it gets hard we move forward and we learn so i think that's really cool man really congrats man that's seriously thanks now feels like the right time for me to do this because if I don't do this now when when should I do this you know it's now or never basically when I see you turning tables I have no idea how the hell it works how you got there how did you get started where, where did you learn how to do that well in my world of like you know hip-hop kind of beat making and scratching and all that stuff I am really really bad <laughs> at all that kind of stuff when it comes to the turntable uh, I am I am, seriously, for real. It's not even me trying to be humble or whatever. I'm a really bad scratch DJ, for sure. We can tell, <laughs> we can tell, don't worry. No, but the, I mean, I don't wanna be, <laughs> I don't wanna be negative, but that's also maybe a specific kind of thing that everyone doesn't know a lot about. So then it becomes kind of easy to make it sound good and fool people like you into thinking I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm honest because 
the fact of the matter is that if if like a good turntable scratch DJ hears me scratching, it's laughable almost, <laughs> almost. Uh, I'm getting better at it, but I'm not a good scratch DJ. And people think that sometimes and ask me questions like this, and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm just <laughs> doing the basic scratches, and I'm trying to, you know. Uh, and I don't, <laughs> I'm not even ashamed of it because I like the sound of scratching. I like the sound of my scratching, the basic, basic scratch stuff. But if you're asking like a proper turntable DJ, yeah, accurate beats, he, he sucks at scratching. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what it is. You know, I think that yeah, there's, there's an interesting point there. Have you heard of the, what's it, the um, imposter syndrome? Have you heard about that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's what I live by. Whenever people like ask me like, oh, how do you know so much about synths? Or, you know, oh, you play the piano. And I'm like, no, 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 wait, wait up. I really have no idea what I'm doing. Me neither. I just, you know, I enjoy these things and I play stuff that sounds good. And the synths, you know, I try to find the sounds that I love. But like whenever I see like, I don't know, a uh, loop pop or, or the great uh, sonic state, I'm like, dude, these people know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And hearing you right now makes me wonder if maybe just everybody thinks that they suck and you know we're all just living in the same you know in the same perspective <laughs> well, uh, yeah in some way i think you're right but but also I, I can i can say when it comes to like instruments like pianos and keyboards and basses and whatever i don't really know what i'm doing there either and i'm not even considering myself to be a good producer i'm a somewhat decent beat maker but I'm not good at any of these things like in in a vacuum. If you if you if you if I can combine all the stuff that I kinda know, it becomes something decent or even good sometimes. But I mean, put me in front of a keyboard, I don't really know what I'm doing. But allow me to combine that keyboard with a bass line and some drums, some scratches, and some sound design and stuff, then it becomes this whole thing. I've actually had this plan for a couple of years to make a video called The Master of Nothing because that's kind of how I see myself. I, I'm decently good at some of the different things and then I have the capacity to like put that into a package that sounds decent. I see my music making as I'm making a collage basically of sounds and then I don't need to be a good scratch DJ to make the scratching sound cool. I don't need to be a good keyboard player to make the keyboard thing sound cool. And all I really want is to make stuff sound cool. This is really refreshing, especially like for me, dude. You're, I, I swear, you're one of my musical heroes. I just love the way you make beats. Oh, come on. Seriously, seriously, dude. I'm a fan. I'm going to make you uncomfortable right now. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Thank you. As a viewer, you, you usually think, oh, this guy just made a... An, an amazing beat in just like five minutes. Wow, I wish I was that talented. So hearing you say that is just really cool because it, it it relieves lots of the pressure because you think that you have to be a great keyboardist, you have to be a great drum, a uh, finger drummer. And maybe it's just like you said, it's you know knowing enough about each one of those aspects to make the whole thing sound good. Yeah, that's that's key to me, uh, definitely. But, but I'm also like, I'm, I'm stupid in some, in some ways, because if I hear someone like shredding on guitar, that might be like playing a scale up and down decently fast. And that's impressive to me because I don't know it myself. Yeah. That's cool to me. And like artists and, and painters and tattoo artists and stuff like that, everything they do is super, super impressive to me. But in that realm of like interest, Maybe that person is kind of bad at it compared to like the best ones. It also has a lot of a lot to do with confidence. Mm. Like I'm proud of what I do and I'm a fan of my own music. I don't I'm not ashamed of listening to my own own tracks. It's I think I'm kind of good at what I do, but put me in front of a piano or a guitar even worse, it's not going to be you know anything but you know i think that's also a good point because you know sometimes we like focus too much and maybe waste a lot of time learning something that maybe isn't that essential to the whole process like i remember like especially at the beginning i spent so much time learning about um you know mastering mixing and cueing and in the end like for example with synths most of them you know the patch already comes like pretty much eq'd you know like you don't if you have a bass it's going to be bassy <laughs> if you have a, a lead it's 
it's it, it already comes like the preset already comes like prepackaged. Yeah. So you know you should learn a bit about that. But you know obsessing over one thing maybe isn't that if it's not your your purpose. You know unless you want to be an audio engineer or something like that. Sometimes maybe it's better to focus on different things so you can do more. Like for example, I, I grabbed the the bass guitar at the beginning of the year, and it's been really fun. And you know started scales and stuff. Like that. But I don't have the objective of becoming, you know, the next bass rock star, you know, and that also relieves a lot of the pressure. So I enjoy it more knowing that I'm going to do like these simple melodies oh, and oh. maybe with time I'll get better. But it's not this pressure that, oh, man, I suck at bass because I do. Yeah. And I almost made this entire thing into like a thing to live by when it comes to creative work in general. That even if I had the time to learn how to properly play pretty much everything on the keyboard, a part of me kind of, I don't even want to learn more because I'm great at what I do to the extent where I'm at right now. It doesn't need to be more complicated because if I, if it, if I make it more complicated, I'm terrified that that's going to affect my creativity and my output in a negative way. I work a lot with, with samples, right? A sample from vinyl and I just cut it up in, in machine or an MPC or whatever. And sometimes when I'm trying to find like fitting chords and, and notes and stuff to that, this is a few years ago, but I became kind of like disappointed of myself when I found samples and chopped things up and then it became like two chords playing between A minor and F, A minor, F. And then I felt like, yeah, what kind of a musician am I? I'm making beats in A minor and F back and forth. There's a psychology to that sometimes, somehow, that I feel like, yeah, this is too basic. But if I had, if I didn't even know the chords and if I, try, if I didn't try to put it on the piano, I wouldn't even think about that. I would just listen to it and be happy. And then I'm second guessing myself because it's too simple. Come on, who cares about that, really? It sounded decent before and it sounds the same now, even though I know it's just two chords. And making it too complicated kind of makes it not as fun. Does that even make sense? I don't know. That's just how I think about it. Dude, absolutely. I don't know, maybe it's because social media shows us so many talented people because like, you know, you go like one second on Instagram, there's uh, Jay Black finger drumming the hell out of his MPC Oof, and you're like, I, yeah. I could never get there. I, I can't do that. And that and that kind of starts intimidating you and you're like, wait a minute, should I even try? Or is my stuff too basic? Some of the favorite songs that I've made either on the piano or on the guitar are four chords in, you know, very typical progression. There's nothing fancy about it. Right. But they're really heartfelt and I really like them to this day. And you're like, did they need to be more complicated than that? No, they didn't. So why am I second guessing that right now? I think I blame Instagram. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true to some extent, of course. Uh, but also when I find myself doing stuff that's too simple nowadays, I'm just turning my, my brain off and just turning my ears on and listening mm. to the music. And if I think it's good, it's good. It doesn't matter how complicated or how advanced or whatever it is. And I mean, that goes for the scratching stuff as well. Like someone like you says that I'm great at scratching. I know that I'm not, but I'll make it sound decent in the videos. And I think that's cool. I'm proud of that. I don't need to be the best scratch DJ ever, but I can do what I do. And no one can take that away from me, even though you might be a better scratch DJ. That doesn't matter because I know all these different things. This is what I do. Scratching is just a tiny, tiny part of it. Exactly. I just thought of a great example of that. You know, I saw this special on Ringo Starr. You have like these great drummers. I remember there's like Dave Grohl and there's like the Chad from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And they were like, this guy didn't make the most complex beats, but he is the master of feel, of groove, you know? Oh. The feeling of, of his beats, it's it, it it's out of this world. So I think that there's a huge part of the emotion and the feeling that you give your music, which transcends whatever complexity it has. And I certainly feel that like mm. when I'm playing the keys, as I said before, I'm not a big piano player, but I try to like infuse it with as much emotion as I can. And I think it sounds pretty good. And, and that's enough. It should be enough. I think it is enough. If you can listen back to it and be proud of your work, it's more than enough. 
And being like a person on, on YouTube and whatever, having somewhat of an audience that appreciates your work, that speaks volumes of what you're capable of. You can't, I mean, comparing yourself to like a keyboard player, that doesn't make sense. And for me to like compare myself to a proper scratch DJ, doesn't make sense. Like that's my whole like creative and expertise or whatever, but that's what I'm trying to do. Um, I know enough about a lot of things to make it work. It doesn't always needs to be like super fantastic, amazing, the best stuff you've ever heard. <laughs> it transmits a feeling I have, an emotion exactly. and a vibe. And that's what creativity is to me. Um, like being super technical about anything, that's being technical and, and being skilled. I'm, my skill is beat making, and beat making is everything combined into one. And that's more important to me than anything else. Well said, dude. <laughs> well, well said. I keep repeating myself, but I think this is kind of important. A lot of people are scared to be creative because it's it's too difficult. And people are scared to, to mix and master the tracks because there are some rules to follow. Sure, there are, but you don't have to adapt to every single rule and, and do anything by the book at all. It's creativity. You can do, you're supposed to be free, you know? Yeah. yeah I remember like well, the, one of the, um, one of my projects, I actually like hired a, a, an, an audio engineer and he was like mixing and mastering. And I, I was like, I had zero confidence in my own mixing skills and mastering skills. So I, I brought these like stems and I was like, or this mix, I don't know. I'm like, what do you think of the mix that I made? You know, I think it sounds pretty good, but uh, can you EQ it or anything? And I, I always remember what he said. He said, if it sounds good, it is good. Forget about the graph. 100%. 100%. And, and that's why I feel like working with machine and NPCs and stuff, that puts me more in the mindset of listening to what I do instead of watching like meters and numbers and stuff. The tactile feeling of just making something, being outside of the box, outside of the numbers, outside of that entire realm of just having to like see stuff that you can compare to something else. To me, that's, that's poisonous, that's dangerous. I need to be in the zone creating something, listening, and just not thinking too much about it. I think that what you just said is the big difference. Like every time I grab Ableton, I find myself looking at the numbers, looking at the EQ and seeing out of all of my options, which one I'm gonna use. And instead when I'm using something like the MPC or the, the Roland Phantom, it's, it's really crazy how fast you can go if you have limited options. And you're like, okay, now I need a piano and okay, there's the piano. And now I need a drum and here's a drum. And you're not thinking you know, about panning and mixing and that comes later on. But it gets in the way and you, you know, just like that, you lose the idea and, and it's gone and it's gone. Yeah. And I think that's, that's dangerous. And now we're talking again about like comparing yourself to others. And I mean, sure, it makes sense to, to like reference your mix of a f finished track to something else and just see if it's in the ballpark in the same like volume or whatever. That kind of makes sense. But do that for five or 10 minutes. Don't be stuck at working like that for, for hours and hours. And normally for my beats that I post on YouTube and whatever, my drum sounds sometimes, I second guess myself like after the video is posted and I'm realizing that, hey, that snare is way too loud in the mix. And I don't even wanna go back and fix it because the product is already finished with too loud of a snare drum and no one's gonna kill me for that. We can't keep up messing about with our minds like that and like forcing us to 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 do things that doesn't come natural for us. I'll make music how I may make music and I think it sounds good. That's the end of it. Absolutely. You know, it's it's kind of strange because I, I have I've been adopting the same thought process like for the last few months because like before I would worry a lot, you know, that you know the mixing wasn't right or the volumes weren't set. And then I started thinking about how I consume music in, you know, YouTube or, or, or Instagram. I'm not really worried about that stuff. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be watching Red Means recording and be like, okay, this OP1 jam is pretty nice, but the piano is a bit loud. I'm, I'm not thinking about that, no. you know? No, never. You're just enjoying the process and you're enjoying the music. So like when, when I've started posting recently, I'm just like, does it sound good? Did I enjoy making it? Okay, that's enough. Maybe I'll, I'll just like figure out if it's clipping or if it's, you know, too 
gloomy or whatever, but minimal stuff because in the end, that's precious time that you're wasting that no one's gonna really benefit from it. Yeah, and maybe that's us talking as like older guys who's been doing this for a few years by now. <laughs> but I mean, when yeah. I started out making beats, I just, I could spend hours in my, in my sample libraries just looking for the right kick drum. And today, there's no such thing as a right kick drum. It's crazy how much time you spend like that. And maybe, maybe because we have spent all that time, we're realizing that you have to like make faster decisions and, you know, be more immediate with your stuff. Maybe yeah. that's necessary to go through that process. But now when I don't think like that anymore, it's just a lot freer and a lot easier to create when I'm not second guessing each and every single choice I make. This is strange because like what, what you're saying really resonates a lot. And I want to see if you agree with this. I feel like I've had like two best moments of music making. The first was when I just started out, when I was so bad at everything that I really didn't care what people thought. And I just, you know, I was just free and, and I made some stuff that I'm really proud of. Mm -hmm. And then I started going into the spiral of, okay, now I'm going to have to do this like a pro and, you know, like really worry about, you know, I'm, am I using all the highs? Am I using all the low? Is my, you know, is my spectrum filled up? <laughs> and I started making really crappy music, like really, really bad. And now I feel like I'm going, you know, I, I went over the hill and I'm, I'm going back into like what, what we're saying right now. That's like, Okay, does it sound good to me? I don't worry that much about, you know, is the EQ perfect, is the panning perfect, is the mastering perfect? Do you think, like, does that happen to most people? Did it happen to you? <clears throat> exactly the same. Exactly the same thing. And on top of that, I had a few years, actually, where I kind of tried to find my sound. And now I'm, I've realized that there's no such thing as my sound. I make what I make, and it normally sounds kind of similar, so that's my sound. But developing a sound of your own and like my fingerprint for, for music, I'm, I've made so much crappy music that doesn't sound like <laughs> the stuff I make today. And I thought like, yeah, I'm this, I'm this guy who's gonna make hip hop beats, but it's gonna be super electronic and super modern. I thought like that for years, just setting my mind to that for some reason. And nowadays I'm like the opposite of that. And to me, that whole thing about second guessing yourself and trying to go for a certain type of sound, go for a certain type of skill, to me, nothing like that makes sense anymore. And maybe that's because again, we're a little bit older, but what you're saying totally resonates 100%. I'm exactly the same. You've been using the MPC, the the, uh, the the machine and everything. You know that the keys was kind of controversial, you know, with all the Ben Jordan stuff going on and everything. Oh, uh, yeah, I know. You know, how about you? Like, what, what was your experience? Because like, you're a hardcore MPC user. And like, I made a little video about it. You know, I kind of thought that the MPC keys could have been its own like line, you know, like a workstation with some MPC features like the force. It's its own line. I have nothing against it and probably will try to, you know, work with it sometime in the future. But how about you? Like, how was your experience, especially coming with your background? Uh, I think the answer here is kind of straightforward, actually. The MPC Key 61 is an MPC. And to me, it's just as powerful and just as good as the MPC Live 2 or my MPC 1 or whatever. It's, it's an MPC plus a keyboard and a little bit more stuff on the back. If I wanted something that it sounds like Ben Jordan is looking for, I wouldn't go for the MPC Live. If you want an MPC and you want the keyboard and you want some more connectivity, it's pretty much the perfect device uh, for someone like me. Because I do that thing when I, I'm chopping samples and I'm putting drums on it and then like a bass line and then I find the chords and I combine stuff, the MPC works flawlessly for me, but I'm not trying to go for the most like advanced things that it can do, because I know there are limitations with that sort of stuff. You no, know, absolutely. <laughs> so, I, like for me, like the measurement is: Am I enjoying my time? Because like every single piece of gear I had has a few flaws, has a few bugs, and to me, at least, if it's if if it doesn't get into the way of my process, if it doesn't get into the way of you know, oh, I have to stop working and I can't you know restart working in a long time unless I fix this bug, which is kind of the reason I stopped using DAWs, then, you know, it's it's okay. Yeah, and I think one thing that really deserves to be said about the MPC uh, keys is that, like, 
the workflow, the alignment of everything is so awesome to use. Everything just sits in the right place and the whole, because it's angled, you have the keys like that and then you have the, the angle for the top. It makes so much sense and it's so comfortable to work on and the workflow just becomes so fluid and natural. I find myself making beats on the Key61 even though I'm not always using the keyboard. I'm using the pads like a normal MPC, but it's just comfortable to work on. Something about the, the form factor of it just makes a ton of sense. I want to talk to you a little bit about a personal issue. When you see somebody on YouTube or on a social platform, it's weird because you think they, they can't get hurt or they can't get diseases or, you know, they're kind of immune to everything in real life. So when you come out and go like, okay, guys, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be here for a while because, you know, I have a brain tumor. That experience was, I mean, it must have been terrible. It sucked uh, big time. But I also kind of quickly made the decision to, to share this on, on YouTube because that's where I have people following and watching and, and whatever. And it made total sense for me to share that on YouTube and I'm not regretting that for a second at all. That was the best decision I could make at that time, for real. That experience was tough. The worst thing I've been through in my entire life, for sure. And I think I learned something from it. As a viewer, that was inspirational as fuck. <laughs> Seriously. Thanks. First, like you're a public person, you know, that YouTube is, it's a talking head. And when you come out with the eye patch, I was like, dude, this guy has huge balls. <laughs> like, I, like there's no other way to say it. Your icon, I, I will never forget the icon with the patch. Oh yeah. That was epic. That was that was just a killer move. And why am I bringing this up? This isn't, this isn't just like random. Last year, not this year, my brother, my big brother, he's like my best friend in the world. He goes to the doctor, to the neurologist, and he comes back and he's like, dude, I have a tumor the size of a grapefruit inside of my head. First of all, obviously, we were all in shock. We were all like, you know, this, uh, how could this happen? You know, he showed me the, the scanner and everything. And then I remembered, wait a minute. I remember Accurate talked about something like this. And I was able to show all your process to my brother. And thanks to your videos, that just took a huge load off because he didn't know if he was like they had to just same as you they had to take it out oh. and he was worried you know he was gonna you know lose his sight or you know uh, get deaf or not be able to walk you know like he has like just he's a little bit older than us you know he has he has two kids but he thought this was the end you know like i'm not sure if i'm gonna be able to work anymore and everything and I, I'm pretty sure it's this, it's a uh, myeloma. It's it, it's the same. I think it's the same. Sorry, meningioma. Meningioma. What what was yours? Sorry. Kind of early on in that entire process, I I decided to not make my condition and my sickness into an interest of mine. That's not that's not going to be a hobby. I'm not going to think about it more than I need. No. Um, I know that this is going on and it's bad and I'm going to go through this and that, but I didn't do a lot of research at all. And now when you ask me what it was called, I don't even know. Acoustic phenoma, enoma, phrenoma, something like that. I don't even know because I decided I'm not going to, I'm not going to care too much about this because in that case, you know, I'm, I'm a nerdy type of person. So whenever I set my mind into something, I'm, if I'm going to research something, I'm going to research it fully. And in this case, it just made more sense to not research it at all. Just leave this thing to the doctors and to the Swedish healthcare system. And thankfully, everything went really, really well now, a few years later. Um, but, you know, I went through it and how it affected my life and what I went through. That's the important part for me what it was, how big it was, what it was called and how bad it could have been. I don't even want to I don't even want to go there because that's scary stuff. I was I was I don't know if I said it flat out on on a video, but I was really scared for my life. I thought this thing could kill me. And it could. It, it could have killed me if things went south, but it didn't. And I'm I'm sorry to hear about your brother, but I'm also kind of kind of glad to hear that something I made made an impact in any type of way at all. That's, that's cool.
It was huge. Maybe like, just like you said, sometimes we make something and we don't know the impact it has on other people's lives. And at least for me and my family, dude, we, we held on to those videos because like, look, he had the same <laughs> brain tumor and look at him. He's back and he's, look, he's scratching, you know, apparently not very good at it, but. <laughs> no, not really. But I mean, what I'm trying to say is that there was more parts here that I didn't really show on video, partly because it was too, too tough. I mean, the first time when I came home from, from the, after the surgery with the eye patch and the whole crooked face and everything. And I tried to play on machine and my right arm just didn't follow. I couldn't keep beat at all. I couldn't actually brush my teeth because I couldn't like, <laughs> stupid thing to mention, but you, I could move my arm, sure. But I wasn't like in control over how much force I put into anything. So when I brushed my teeth, uh, you know, all of a sudden the arm just went haywire and like smacked my mouth open. You know, a lot of things happened and a lot of things could have gone a lot worse, but I had this freaking walker that I walked with for, for weeks and I had a, I had a cane for months. I mean, I was pretty, pretty badly damaged by the whole thing. And now I'm still crooked in my, my, my face is still a little bit wonky and I'm permanently deaf on one ear. Other than that, I'm good. I've talked to people who went through this, like your brother and other people too, that kind of reached out to me and asked me how things went and also to thank me for stuff. Some people gets it way worse and some people gets it way easier. It, you know, it's kind of a roll of the dice. And uh, I, had, I had a rough time but I'm happy to be out of that. And I'm happy to hear that your brother is fine. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Dude, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us today, man. I'm, I'm, I feel absolutely privileged and I'm thankful that my YouTube journey has led me to meet my heroes, basically. Thank you. And thanks for inviting me. I, I had an awesome time and it was really good chatting with you. I appreciate this. I like this a lot. To everybody watching, thank you so much. I hope you found this video useful or at least entertaining. And I'll see you again next week.